such a pleasure uh, to be here together. And, and um, I think uh, having had such a lot of discussion on digital public infrastructure, I think it's time to talk about what does it take to drive actions for transformation. Any large scale societal transformation must navigate complexities across the prevalent systems and habits of governments, businesses, civil society, communities. It's not hard to drive, uh, it's not easy to drive such large scale change. The objective of this panel is to learn from the experiences and expertise of the panelists and deliberate how to trigger actions that can mobilize transformation journeys across countries. Now, this is a very complex subject because we could keep going at it for probably a couple of years, uh, but we have very little time. And so we thought we would box this into three broad thematic conversations. One is around the knowledge and action leap. So yeah, I think with so much of narrative, so much of conversation, there's a lot of knowledge getting diffused across there are DPIs and we can do this and we can do that. But the question is, how do you move from knowledge to action? And that's a leap. Uh, many people would say, I do not know how to do these things. Or even if I know, I do not know how to convert it into design in my context. Or even if it's designed, I don't know how to demonstrate the way potential value to the stakeholders. What do I do? So this freeze between the knowledge and the action is one conversation. Second is there's the scale orchestration leap because one, even if you can try and see the idea working somewhere else, you have to bring it home and you have to make it work in that ecosystem. You have to orchestrate between different actors of the society, governments, businesses, civil society, and also you have to align resources, incentives, complexities of regulation, sometimes laws. And so there are a lot of actions that need to be taken for this transformation to happen. And the third important axis is the whole societal leadership axis, because in the end, these are not short term, these are not small things, they require tenacity, they require perseverance, they require enormous amount of ability to weather transitions, political transitions, economic transitions. And so how do you ensure that that happens? How do you ensure it is governed in the right manner, that it is safe, it is inclusive, uh, it has the right guardrails uh, so that it does not cause any harm to the society uh, by intended or unintended. But the question is, these are the three main axes we would like to explore. And uh, we have an amazing panel. So we are looking forward to their experiences. And I would like to start by opening up the conversation to say that each of the panelists um, choose a leap, whether it is a knowledge action leap or is it the scale orchestration leap or it is the societal leadership leap and share a pretty personal experience uh, in transforming large scale transformation, digital transformation in the context of your focus country. Uh, so it will be good to get your warm up to your perspectives, things that work and sometimes even things that did not work because many a times we learn how to do things by things that did not work. So probably I would like to open the floor uh, with uh, Alice. Great, uh, thank you so much Sanjay and everyone here. My name is Alice Gugulev with Global Development Incubator. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I work uh, around the world, not just in Kenya. And for those not familiar, Global Development Incubator is a nonprofit and we very much work on this kind of thinking of scale, sustainability, and systems change. Uh, in many ways, what I care about very much probably is across all three, Sanjay, that you've talked about, um, where I do wanna build long-term institutions and infrastructure. And the way that we incubate is through a build, operate, and transfer model. And we've done this in uh, economic inclusion with the Partnership for Economic Inclusion at the World Bank. Uh, many of you on the call are doing registration and social protection, poverty alleviation, et cetera. We've done this in uh, mental health, youth employment, uh, kind of value-based healthcare, if you will, uh, financing for commercial banks and blended financing, et cetera. Uh, even in India, recently looking at the Migrants Resilience Collaborative, for those that might be familiar, familiar with that. So the first thing I would say, the way that I've approached this in the past, where here's a fantastic technology, let me bring it uh, to a government uh, and so forth, that never seems to work. And I know it's obvious, and but it often gets lost, nevertheless. 
And so for me, DPI and all of this discussion is really critical uh, for scaled social change. But for me, it's really about shifting mindsets first, shifting thinking first, and then saying, look, there's a technology that can be supportive. And whenever I don't do the first, I can never even get to a technology conversation. And so for me, it really comes down to, and I'll, I can use any of these examples, but I can, let's say, talk about something that uh, it seems like many on the call are interested in, uh, which is social protection and economic inclusion. And so the way that we approach it is really in four ways. And I'll even bring it down specifically to Kenya. The first th thing that we do is we really understand what is scale. Because at the moment, the whole world is uh, not really defining the issue at the size of the challenge. When I was in the private sector, we always thought about market share. What's the size of the market? Uh, I really don't see a lot of people understanding what's the size of the challenge. And so globally, there's, yes, 700 plus million people living on less than $1.90 a day. But when we started working in Kenya on this, how many people are actually part of this target segment? People didn't know. <laughs> so it was it was actually very interesting to even say there are 14 million people living under the poverty line that can qualify to be the ultra poor, for example, in Kenya. And so the, from there, the understanding is that we're going to design something at that level. That means I have to talk at the ministerial level. I have to talk at the president level. That's the level that you need to engage. And so one big aha moment is how do you really define the size of the challenge. The second is how do you then design for scale? If you think about, and donors are probably the worst culture, culprits here, is that donors love to fund a small pilot and then scale up that pilot. They don't really think about designing for scale, designing for the scale of, you know, the size of the challenge, if you will. And so in what we've been doing here in Kenya, and it's not very easy uh, given policies, politics, uh, et cetera. Um, but what we're really trying to do is build something that's going to be long lasting, institutionalized at the scale of the challenge. And that has to be through government. It cannot be purely through NGO delivery mechanisms. And so it's one thing saying that, but actually engaging at the country to be able to do that and to find the pathways to do that has been um, very challenging, if you will. And so what you're trying to build right from the beginning is a scalable system, a scaled system around shifting this uh, uh, in Kenya. And so what we've been doing is working with NGOs to shift even the way that NGOs operate, to shift the way that the World Bank thinks about it, to shift the way that other philanthropists consider it so that they're designing at that level as opposed to direct implementation, test something and, and scale it up. And so the very definition of the pilot changes. You're not piloting an intervention, you're piloting that systemic shift. And that's been you know, a lot of our experience here. The final thing I'll mention, and this is the hardest, which is around incentives and accountability. And so this is where a lot of these things fail. You know, where we cannot set up the right incentive structures that focus on improved income, savings, assets, et cetera, as well as critically the incentives of the government to distribute payments, to have the right uh, uh, registration systems, et cetera. They know in Kenya here all the models that exist, whether it's Adahar, whether it's, um, you know, so many different payment systems that uh, registration systems and payment systems that exist around the world but they're still not taking it up. So here we are sitting uh, in Kenya with the World Bank, with this knowledge, and they're building their own system. And so I cannot tell you how frustrating that is to see and to really understand how do you really shift the thinking first before we bring in the actual uh, correct system that's really appropriate for them. And so at the moment, we're still stuck in uh, a country where they see it, they have the tools, but until we change that mindset, we're not gonna really be able to apply any of these great technologies uh, to, the, to the challenges at hand. Thank you so much, Alice. I think uh, this whole drive of shifting mindsets is such an important point because the mindset over wins, always wins over the mind. Um, let us shift continents and let's go to Brazil. So let's hear Fernanda. Uh, how would you like to respond to what have been your life experiences? 
Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, amazing to be here. Uh, just uh, to go back a little bit, um, I'm one of the founders of Right Capital. Um, we are a multifamily office that we only take care of families that want to, you know, are interested in social transformation. So because of that, we started investing in impact a few years ago. And uh, I would say to today, uh, we already have track record. We've proven that impact, you know, you can make money and everything, but still today it's hard to change the mindset. So um, by doing that, by investing in impact, uh, we've been exposed to, you know, I think Brazil's major problems. And um, I would like to, you know, tell the story of a personal experience which involves India. And um, we were investing in impact uh, since 2010. And um, so everybody that comes to Brazil ends up passing by our office. And there was the, this uh, Indian VC called Aspada. And I remember that was around 2016 and they sat next to me and uh, the guy got into a system and with facial recognition, he was doing payments. And I was like, what is that? And he goes, you don't know other. I was like, no, how come? What is this? And uh, so that was the first time I got exposed to that. And that was mind blowing. Uh, I ended up uh, meeting uh, Adar and met, met Sahil and uh, the team. I, since then I've been uh, trying to bring digital ID to Brazil. Uh, had experiences with Vijanti here and CV um, back in 2018. Um, Brazil is in the in the research work of the ID for the, and um, I I would say the the mind the mindset shift is one of the hardest things. Um, I can't uh, stop thinking about you know. Uh, uh, this TED talk that London did in 2009 saying, you know, we need to empower the people. And uh, for Brazil, this could not be more truth, right? We have uh, 220 million people. And uh, one of the biggest inequality indices in the world. And um, so we have, I always say that we have two countries in one country. So on one side, um, we have, you know, a, a super advanced uh, financial system. Uh, we have, for example, um, 1,300 fintechs in the country. We have the PIX, which is the digital transfer, right? With uh, the payment. Uh, we now go into Real Digital, which is the digital currency. Um, you know, our system works perfectly, it's super regulated. Um, but if you look at the data, you will find out that 70% of the credit transactions are concentrated in five banks, and that is scary. So, how are you going to empower people like that? Um, we have an amazing work, and uh, I know Ciro is participating here, of uh, the our digital platform from the government, uh, gov.br. And uh, this has been a work, insane work for a team that has been doing that since, I don't know, 2016 or, or before. And we today, we have four, uh, almost uh, 5,000 services uh, in this platform, in this government platform, and uh, 140 million users. So this is, okay, so this is great, right? But uh, we need this um, connectivity. We need the DPI to come, you know, to the mindset uh, of the government. Um, for example, uh, we have uh, amazing research on agriculture. We are a super strong exporter. We have Embrapa, but when you look at the other side, you have 50% uh, of the, the exports are concentrated in, in 40,000 big farmers. And then you have almost 5 million small farmers 
that lack information and you know this is uh this is a huge gap um we have another beautiful experience in the country which is the SUS for health right it's connected and it's finally data SUS starting to work with blockchain all, all that but it's not connected to the other systems and um and last education which is really uh in another area and this is probably i think one of the major concerns um just heard nandan talking about human capital as a future for the nation we have 36 percent of the young people between 18 and 24 are not studying neither working uh, we have a very complicated systems for for education and uh we 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 lack access and we need the students you know to be interested but how will the student be interested if they need to work so this is uh we we have a lot of uh, uh of 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 um uh, actions here it's still a long way to go uh we have my friend maida at the call as well and she's uh developing uh technical uh, courses for for young people in Brazil and this is huge we need to multiply that so I always like to say that um, for me I look at always two countries you know so how can we make the the country who owns the power help the country that does not that's the difficult part thank you for that Fernanda I think that would be relevant analogy for many countries uh, given the way the world has shaped uh, where there would be these two different completely different ecosystems and dpis of course uh, have a role to play in bridging these two countries and uh, on one end you mentioned the similarity to what alice was saying in terms of mindset shift but i think you also took the pain to explain that every country needs to understand the problem from these lenses rather than only assume that, oh, we have this, 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 this technology, so we are all well, but which part and which country does it serve? And so what should we do next is a part of the action framing. Okay, I'm going to take my next flight and land up in uh, Norway with uh, Liv. So let's listen to what perspective does Liv have. Thank you so much for uh, for having me. And I, I have to say, I love the title of this panel and just uh, the composition of the panel. It's a wonderful group to be in. Uh, and I've taken many notes and um, done a lot of nodding. Um, so so first of all, I, I will, like Alice, tell a story, not so much about one country, Norway, but more about um, my experience, but of course, uh, as an Norwegian, uh, but around how to build the international alignment um, around the concept of relevance for scaling digital public infrastructure everywhere. And I have chosen the scale orchestration leap uh, as, as my story. Uh, and I wanted to start by taking us back to 2018, when um, I had the privilege of working with a Norwegian minister who was part of the UN Secretary General's high level panel on digital cooperation. So this was uh, a forum, an expert panel, but with some political representatives as well, who were not always that much experts, so they needed support for this as well. <laughs> but um, it was uh, put together to really look at how to, um, to look for new digital cooperation approaches that could really help accelerate progress towards attainment of the sustainable development uh, goals. And um, I did come in there working with this Norwegian minister and thinking about what was Norway doing in the international development space, which was very much the framing. Um, and Norway had this um, strong experience of working, for instance, with open health information systems, so open source, uh, and also in uh, weather data and forecasting models. And was at the same time also seeing, and I think you mentioned this, Alice, this pilotitis uh, challenge, like this tendency for a number of stakeholders, this was very much, um, for instance, in global health, there was this horrible tendency for many, many stakeholders to develop the same solution to more or less the same problem, sometimes even in the very same context. So there was a perception that there was duplication of effort and tremendous waste of resources, time and, and, and money. And, and But what happened for, for the minister that was working and also for me was that there was this 
surprised that we were not the only ones that had thought of this. <laughs> there was indeed uh, many, many stakeholders that had been thinking about this for, for quite some time and that had also been working at it from different approaches. Um, so, um, and there was, for instance, this meeting at uh, at the World Bank meeting in Bali, where uh, the minister I worked with met Nanda Nilekani, and immediately after he picked up the phone and he called me and he's like, Leave, you really, really need to speak to this guy. There's something huge happening in India, and there's something called MOSIP being developed to scale digital identity, and uh, and so on. And this was back in 2000, and I think it was 2000, and late 2018, early 19. Anyway, uh, of course, I did get in touch with Nandan again. <laughs> <laughs> and and it turned out, you know, that um, there were large scale initiatives happening around open source uh, for that could help countries address some of the most urgent international development challenges. There were really some uh, scalable thinking taking place around this. But what was also becoming clear as this high level panel was having its discussions was also how much open washing there was in the sense that there were tons of projects that were conveyed as being open in the sense that we you can take whatever you want from our website uh, or like this is an open project except that we're not sharing the code with you and so on so it was very um it was very hard for stakeholders to know what they could really adopt and adapt to meet their own needs and what was what was just open by name only um so that uh, this became like an area where the panel felt it could really make a difference. So one of the recommendations for the, from this high level panel was to create an alliance and a platform around digital public goods. And the digital public goods, the whole idea here was to go from having many, many great, a lot of great work being done around principles for how to work in the open, which there were many great principles to build on, to have something more binary. So it was at least possible to say, okay, does this uh, technology have an open license? Has it been designed to minimize the risk of doing harm? Like there were certain critical questions that were actually verified by someone at a certain level. So this has become the standard for digital public goods, which is stewarded by the Dig Digital Public Goods Alliance Secretariat that I co-lead. And uh, the reason why I think this matters so much for orchestration at scale is that in parallel to this, there's been such a rapidly increasing demand for countries for a third way uh, to scale the, uh, or build their the digital public infrastructure. And I think I heard Maduka mention this also in the previous panel that, you know, you had um, the alternative of going with leasing something uh, from a technology company, uh, or um, you could often get help from a country, but very often with many, many political strings attached and also, uh, not the opportunity to uh, make the changes you needed and also with some lock-in risks in both ends and and it's a sovereignty issue right so there's been a tremendous change in in perceptions and attitudes of countries and this includes norway where i'm based as well so there's really a drive now towards looking at what already exists out there that can freely that can be properly adopted and adapted to meet your needs and comes without those strings attached so i do think that for orchestration of scale to have this kind of conceptual alignment and actually something that can be binary, it can be yes or no, <laughs> uh, it is helpful uh, and, and can help navigate in this kind of flurry of things that are a little bit open or follow certain principles. And, uh, and later, I think there are many other topics that were touched upon by the others that I would love to come back to, but uh, handing back over now. And thanks. Thank you, Thank you so much, Liv. I love the idea of saying when it's large and complex drive with clarity don't get lost in this muddy woody things it's yes or no uh, so that we get doing something rather than keep going into circles and the whole power of coming together uh, the power of the alliance the power of the strength of all the actors combining their forces i think such an important uh, area for getting action going um, I would shift our attention to uh, how do we serve the ultra poor, and so I would move uh, to Stephanie to talk to us about what is her perspective, which is the shift that she, or which is the leap that she would like to make us deep dive into. Stephanie. Thanks, Sanjay, and thanks everyone for having me. I'm very excited to be part of this interesting conversation. I think uh, you said we should share something personal, right? I think for me and many on the call, 
one of the big frustrations is that we still design programs that are beautiful, that are perfect, that are very complex. And we do, we design delivery models that are not, that really don't think of government till afterwards, right? So we can call it uh, pilot CITES, but it's really bigger than that, right? Because we design perfect programs, right? And a little bit the earlier, that, right? We're thinking of triggers, of more complicated systems. COVID saw a lot of innovations around delivery systems, social registries are on up, and we're designing these programs and we're not really thinking about are they going to work for government? Does government have access to a workforce that can man them? Uh, uh, are they aligned with government priorities? Are we building parallel systems? Uh, do people understand what they're doing? And I a big frustration of mine is the amount of conversations I've been in with policymakers who just don't understand the digital infrastructure that is meant to enable them, empower them to take good policy decisions and deliver programs. And I think we're all guilty of that, right? Instead of working on the big sort of mess and challenge and trying to sort of build something that is interoperable, that works, but that is also understandable. We're creating these parallel systems and you end up um, talking to IT people who tell you that for the past 13 years, they have been the only one who knows how to fix the issue in country X social protection program. And we just have these terrible vendor lock-in situations. And you ask yourself, what is going to happen when this person retires? What is the game plan here? You talk to the principal secretary or the minister, and they say they don't understand the data. They just keep on being told the data is a problem. They don't know whether it's true. They don't know where the issue lies, right? So I think we really need to flip things around. We need to design from the beginning for government. Right? And we need to start from the premise of what government wants to do, the workforce it wants to use, and adapt our programs and our delivery models and not design the perfect program that we then try to retrospect uh, retrospectively fit into something that government can work from. And Alice alluded to that a little bit at the beginning, right? But that is very difficult, right? Because like, let's take frontline workers as an example, right? A lot of programs rely on frontline workers. They're highly motivated when they're a, a part of a development program or an NGO program. And governments, you know, often want to use a different type of workforce, right? They tend to rely on volunteers. Uh, communities like to insist that it's someone local. Uh, so how do you, how do you reimagine delivering a quality program where you have different type of frontline worker servicing uh, this crucial function of a program, right? And to give you an example, we are currently working with the South African government, thinking through, okay, what capacity actually exists at local level? You know, what would you be willing to add to your workforce, if at all? Okay, you want to use this type of a workforce. How can we then think about supporting that type of workforce to do the job that we need that to do? And also, how do you incentivize those workers, those frontline workers? You know, what's in it for them? I mean, it's obvious why government wants to use those type of workforce because they're cheaper, right? And NGO programs that rely on highly paid and motivated frontline workers or case workers that get paid well, that are trained, etc. That's not the reality of how government wants to often roll out. So how do you support this different type of frontline worker? How do you incentivize them? How do you make it worth? Uh, how do you backstop them? How do you link them to sort of uh, expert expertise that they need? And how do you make it? How do you start really from where government is, both in terms of its systems and its capabilities and design and build for that, right? And I think this is the big challenge we all have to ask ourselves, right? Who's going to adapt to whom? <laughs> if we want to have governments at the center of what we do, if we want to have government be the driver of scale and innovation, we need to design digital infrastructure, but also programs that are truly owned and understood, right? And we need to, we need to challenge ourselves to do things differently rather than afterwards tinkering around uh, the edges and expecting sort of um, take up and, uh, and scale up. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was so much fun. That was so interesting that we have, we have this entire infrastructure, the human infrastructure that's available to drive this transformation. And we have to find ways to amplify and, and derive the 
advantage and the benefit and the velocity from this entire human infrastructure um, and how do we do that and design differently? Uh, wow, that's an interesting dimension. I am going to now uh, request Linda. Um, Linda, uh, I met her for the first time at, in India during the Global Digital Compact consultations and have learned a lot from her on the idea of governance uh, and how do you build capacity in the entire governing ecosystem, justice lawyers. So I'm, I'm going to leave it to her, but would like love to learn from her what are the other dimensions that you would pick uh, to, to educate us about? Thank you so much, Sanjay. I appreciate it. And um, I, I really enjoyed listening to the discussions here and thought deeply about, um, about my context um, and where we, we exist. Um, I'd want to pick on societal, but really um, mix it up with the capacity, which I think is... Uh, is an interesting thing to talk about. Um, I'll just introduce a bit um, who I am and what I've been working on. Um, in 2017, Kenya went into elections. Um, I'm based in Kenya, but the lawyers have works across the African continent. Um, there are three things that we do that uh, try to solve the problems that we talk about at the Conference of Law and Technology. Um, and um, so, about um, in 2017, Kenya went into elections and uh, we had this huge court case, um, which was an electoral petition uh, talking about the technologies around the election. And so I um, sat at home watching this uh, proceedings and there was a, a cry across the country that they needed to be more lawyers really involved in the, in the tech ecosystem. Um, I've tried coding before, um, and really tried to figure out what was the problem that we could solve for society at the Conference of Law and Tech. And so I founded the Lawyers Hub at that point and made a decision that ideally we should develop more human capacity, especially lawyers, to be part of these particular conversations. Um, I think the data suggests every single day, and I want to you know, really agree with Stephanie on her point around um, what are the technologies doing and what do we do when they're out and what does vendor lock-in look like even in terms of policy. Um, if you look at um, Africans um, policy and regulations, it's very, it's inherited from colonial masters. Um, why haven't we changed our policies? Because it's expensive. And so we change policies that ideally are funded um, or you'd say policy that is lobbied. Um, and so what that means then is if you have the money, then you will change the law. If you don't have it, um, unless there's a public outcry um, that everybody is for this new legislation, you'd really have legislation that ideally benefits society. It's legislation that develops, uh, that benefits corporates or particular politicians in a way they would want to move. And so um, I think that's really important to see then what's the voice of society in uh, these new technologies, but then also looking at new policy frameworks towards getting society to a better place with better guardrails and better safeguards. And so we started the process of engaging on conversations um, that touched on technology. And one of the conversations we had in 2019 uh, was on digital identity. Kenya had um, you know, looked at ways in which they could develop a new um, data policy, um, sorry, a digital ID framework. And so um, we worked on the proposals to the parliament, looked at ways in which you could have a data protection framework. Other people took a different route and went to court. Um, and eventually Kenya came up with a data protection law in 2018, I believe, um, and then came into force right before COVID. And so there are particular um, patterns that we are noticing across the continent. Um, so one would be a push towards digital identity once there is that push towards digital identity, you'll see a lot of uh, vendors trying to push particular products. Uh, but then the reaction from civil society would then be, let's go to court. And so you have this long winded um, legal battles and then this project sort of come to a halt. And then you'd find that government then comes with safeguards um, and say, okay, now we pass a data protection law. So many times it would not even be a comprehensive legislation, you'd see a lot of it being left for regulations. So they would pass a body and say, we're passing to you the data protection law. But everything else in terms of implementation is actually left to the regulations. As we know how laws work, regulations rarely get the attention 
Um, and ministers ideally pass whatever they want to pass because it's the ministerial level that ideally passes the regulations. Um, and so uh, everybody goes home happy we have a framework, but ideally we don't have a framework. But then also what we see in terms of um, pattern is the drive towards a startup law um, and saying we need a startup law to ideally help innovation. Um, but ideally it's not going hand in hand with competition laws. And so my point to drive this home is there's a lot of focus um, within the policy ecosystem. And I think this is um, mostly for Africa. There's a huge focus on single-mindedness and not looking at the entire scope and saying that could we have a less siloed approach towards policy making in a way that we can look at different issues at once, but making sure that this actually gets us to an intended end. Uh, because when we over-focus and say, you know what, uh, we're gonna tax you this way, this is what's gonna happen to the tech ecosystem, we don't think about the fact that we could eliminate competition um, and all this um, sort of um, vendor locking that we're complaining about, uh, monopolies, um, by actually encouraging the, the startup ecosystem to actually grow and get us to that particular point. And we've seen this, um, uh, we've seen this approach, like for instance, uh, when we talk about um, the Ukraine war and we saw what happened with different countries ideally employing their own technologies as like a national defense mechanism. And so what then that means that is that innovation in your country ideally helps you in, in the day of war, if you can be able to put it back. So I think we need to look at it in, in, in that form and be able to have an ecosystem approach towards digital public infrastructure and not just focus on one particular segment. So what is lawyers have doing? Um, we realized that there was um, an opportunity to get everyone on the table. So we have a multi-sectoral approach towards capacity building. We ran a fellowship program uh, that's in its fourth edition. It was initially funded by Omedia Network. Um, and we're looking at ways in which we could let everybody talk to each other, but then build their capacity jointly. So you don't have an overpowerful government that knows what to do with a civil society group that does not know how to keep it accountable. Um, and I think that's that's a really um, important way to, to go about it. But then finally, I want to just talk about um, investments. I think investments in terms of, we look at infrastructure investment and saying this money is going to go into infrastructure, but we don't see that as a capacity investment and saying this is how much we are going to put in training judiciaries to understand when they have conflicts on, on, on new technologies. This is how much you're going to invest in in training, you know, um, capacities of governments and and startups and civil society and groups like that. Um, but then I also want to um, to say that it's interesting how technologies are. One country can be such a powerhouse um, in terms of technology, and then the elections are so badly run, and you wonder how do you not um, make sure your technologies ideally help the rest of society. I'll give an example. So most of Africa voting is done in schools. Um, I was privileged to observe the elections in Nigeria a few months ago um, as part of the Commonwealth Observer Team. And I was surprised by how people could vote anywhere. They just set up a box in the middle of a market and everybody goes to vote. Uh, but Nigeria is creating such good content um, in terms of technologies. A lot of the developers that are running companies in Silicon Valley are coming from India and, and, and Nigeria. But we don't harness that power and say that, how do we then use you know, um, our talents to go into this? Elections are done in schools, for example, in Kenya, but we don't think about how do we harness education and ed tech so that when we go into elections, we are gonna use the same schools, the same technology could be employed into, into elections as well. So I think this whole um, siloed approach to, towards even digital public infrastructure is a problem. My final comment would be on um, what does, it's not going to into the writing and into these conversations. If we know the benefits of DPI, why don't we employ it? Um, I think corruption is such a huge factor to think about, especially in our side of the world, uh, because we buy tech, we use technologies because we are lobbied as members of parliament or, or ministries to be able to use a particular technology. And so it's not necessarily about inclusion and what is good for society, but it's ideally what's good for my pocket and what we're taking home um, as individual politicians or individual leaders. So I think that we need to shift our thinking and talk about the effect of corruption in terms of really looking at societal good and making sure that um, we sort of uphold what's good for society, um, you know, and, and not really, um, you know, think about individual um, systems. I hope that makes sense. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Linda. As I was listening to all of you, a crazy thought came in my mind that there could be one day, imagine the future, where we take a country and all the six of us get together to solve a problem. Because between the six of us, uh, all the vital issues came up, ranging from how do you shift the mindsets, how do you define the problem, how do you create the alliances and the synergy and the ecosystem to come together, how do you design the approach, how do you regulate it, how do you govern it, and I think uh, I will be the one who will make the coffee. Um, and I think this is going to be so much fun, and I really hope that day comes someday. But I'm so grateful that we could get together today, such rich perspectives. I would not even attempt to kind of summarize. Uh, what would be interesting in the few minutes that we have left is to do a very rapid fire on if there was one call to action that you would want us to take to our heart today, what would that one call to action be? Saying, just let's start, let's do this. Right, and Linda has her hand up. So let's start with Linda. <laughs> okay, I was going to say that we need to build scalable policy frameworks, especially digital policy frameworks that we could pick up from India's legislative agenda that has happened on DPI and be able to scale it across. Um, the UN Tech Envoy has, I think, in his um, uh, policy brief, uh, I think in May, he made one suggestion that I think is so powerful on um, digital cooperation, global digital cooperation. I think that's a really important point to think about, that we could have scalable policy frameworks that could be used across. And then just to move towards evidence-based policy making. If the numbers are right, let's build for policy around it. Thank you. Fantastic. And the good news is Amandeep Ji is on the call. So we have that endorsement also going. That's fantastic. All right. Uh, who would like to call the next action out? All right. Leave. No, thank you so much. And I'll try to build on what Linda just said. Um, so I did hear Nandan in the fireside um, chat. He, had, he mentioned something called 50 in 5. So this is actually a campaign that several of us are involved in, which is about empowering 50 countries across geographies and income levels uh, to build out at least one component of their foundational digital public infrastructure in five years, very much because these countries are already in process of doing it. So it's more about uh, how to help shorten learning and adoption journeys. And I think the key message I would like to bring here is the potential for countries to actually help shorten each other's learning and adoption paths, including Linda, uh, to, through sharing uh, policy, uh, best practices, uh, painful learnings and experiences in maybe in closed forums, but really because there's so many learnings across here to help countries avoid making the mistakes that others have done and help them to build on what others have done, including where sometimes also actually sharing technologies as digital public goods. So that would be my call to action. Thank you. Sure. Oh, can I go? Yes, Fernanda, please. Okay, okay. Well, uh, first, uh, I refer so much to what Linda said. Uh, same here, believe me, <laughs> huge scale, same here. And and also what Stephanie was saying uh, regarding, you know, when you get to reality to work uh, with people inside the government, how to, you know, motivate them, how you teach. And uh, I, you know, I met some heroes. One is participating on the call, but some heroes who, you know, give their lives to, to you know, improve the lives of other people. And they are normally, you know, uh, not paid as much or not recognized as much, but amazing how many heroes I've met uh, through the years inside the government, uh, inside some regulators. And uh, these people are really amazing. So when you talk about sharing policy, you know, I think there is a special group of these heroes that should be involved. Uh, I was talking to, to Sanjay the other day, you know, about our database and how should we protect um, a few people, few people in the country here know, for example, that all our data is at AWS. People didn't know. So I'm like, how come you don't know? They don't know. Um, or, you know, when you talk about uh, 
you know, data-driven economy and what this represents and how we need to train people. Um, so I think, you know, sharing knowledge in all the, the places, in universities, in the government, with, with this uh, people who are working in the government, this is super, super important. Uh, Linda mentioned uh, to build scale policy framework. We need that. Um, and now this is this has been discussed now. Um, so I think this 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 group this sharing this is already amazing. Thank you, thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, right. Alice, Stephanie. Who's going? We got to go quickly. Um, okay, Alice. She had I'll go quickly. Um, we've uh, really been quite negative and uh, focused on government. I'm going to take a moment and talk about the private sector because one of the key ways that we're going to fund the sustainable development goals is unlocking private sector capital as well as fiscal budgets. So I do think that there's a huge role, you know, the private sector runs on data. And uh, in many ways, there's a huge role for digital public goods to overcome the market failure that we're seeing right now. The lack of significant investment that's sitting on the sidelines and not coming in to fund value added uh, sectors across Africa. Uh, or even India in the rural sectors. Um, how do you really shift the way that commercial banks uh, do their lending to small and medium enterprises? And so we've had a ton of success, in fact, more than government, on the commercial side, if we're able to put in the right data infrastructure. And that really unlocks uh, trillions of dollars in private sector capital from private equity, uh, commercial banks, debt financing, project financing, et cetera. So if there's one call to action, I wouldn't limit our focus primarily to governments or at least only to governments. Uh, and I know that's where I started the story, but also uh, build out digital public goods that really bring in, crowd in the private sector uh, for this big development agenda. Fantastic. That's such an interesting setup for the next panel discussion. But Stephanie, you have the last word. We can't hear you. It must be, uh, no, I think it's probably your headphones. You may have to change your audio source. Uh, can you hear me now? I was going to say I'm going to keep it very brief. <laughs> I, I think if I had one call to action, I would say I think we need a systems level thinking. And I know this is at the heart of what a lot of people on this call are thinking about anyways, right? We need to get out of our silos stop perfecting our silos. And yes, I think we should crowd in all of the actors, private sector, government, development partners, every, everyone, right? Because it's a big challenge and we don't have much time, like the earlier one said. But we really need to get out of building these perfect silos, these perfect programs, and really think holistically and think from, the reason I like government is because they're there to stay, right? But whoever, like we need to develop a system and infrastructure that is there to say that is owned and that works not for one program, but for any program, right? The the option A, option B, as was discussed at the beginning. It can be, it's it's not tied to one of our programs, not tied to something we're currently trying to solve, but can be used to solve anything, the stuff we haven't yet imagined. Perfect. Thank you so much. It has been such a rich discussion. Uh, so much to take away, which we will summarize and share with many, many more people across the world after this. But I'm so grateful that each of you made it uh, with all your insights and looking forward to the journey ahead. We have only just begun. Thank you so much. Take care and be well.